Hey, family. Hope you're feeling warm. I didn't want you to feel cold here in Scotland, so uh, glad, you're, glad you're here. Let me start by blessing you. We, we want, I want good things for you. I want God's breakthroughs in your life. I want God's help for you in every way. And so every time we, we get ready to preach, I, I like to start with a blessing. So I bless you now in the name of Jesus, that you would know Jesus more wonderfully today. I bless you to receive healing if you need healing in your body, in your mind, in your emotions, in your spirit today. I bless you to receive whatever guidance from God you need today, whatever help from God you need immediately. I bless you to flourish and prevail over whatever challenges you're facing in your life right now. And I bless you to feel hope and joy and love and peace, whatever's going on. I bless you with that in the name of Jesus. May it be. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm going to do something shocking. We're going to start with a map. No, not shocking at all. But yes, we are starting with a map. Okay, this is a recap in case you're new or visiting. We have been going through a Moses series, and we are right now nearly at Jericho, uh, which is the very end of the Moses series. They're, they're, the camp, uh, they're currently camped at the blue box there on the map on the plains of Moab just across from Jericho. We have... We started last week talking about them camping here and how they took the purple area. They captured all the purple area. And we also talked about how the king of Moab, the, named Balak, down the, the lower bit, Moab there, how he has partnered with the Midianites to hire a guy named Balaam to curse God's people. So the zoom out map, which we also looked at last week, was anytime, you, the further you go away from the local area map, the bigger the threat, the bigger the danger. And so we have the Midianites, which are down there um, in modern day Arabia, uh, down along the, I don't know, the side of the Red Sea where, where, where Mount Sinai is. They're partnered with Moab to hire a guy named Balaam, a prophet of God, to come down and curse. Now, pa- Balaam is from Peor, which is Pethor, sorry, Pethor, way up north, about a 20 to 25 day ride on a talking donkey. So, so he, is, he is up there, and so he's coming from a long ways away. Balaam is a big deal. The threat is a big deal. We introduced Balaam last week by talking about how this guy really does know God. He also really wants to follow God. God is his master. God says, don't go. He doesn't go. God says he doesn't like the path that he's on. He's willing to turn around. This Balaam guy really does know God, does care about obeying God, but also he loves money. And and we talked about how that other master, he can't serve two masters, that other master is going to end up getting him in the end. But we're not there yet. So he has journeyed down. He is currently transfixed with following God. He has now arrived at the, well, in this case, the green square with the purple X in it, outlined by purple, so you know where the campsite is. He's arrived there, and he's meeting with the king of Moab. A zoomed-in map, new map for today. Uh, the campground there, the purple square area, I circled Jericho the green, in green across the Jordan River there. It's just across the plain. They are thinking that direction. And I also put these little red triangles on the map um, to symbolize mountain peaks. I know, my artistry, wow. It's pretty phenomenal. The only mountain peak of the ones that we're looking at in today's story, it seems like he, they go around to different mountain peaks where they look over the, the plains of Moab and where, where they're, Balak and Balaam are going to be cursing God's people from. The one that we know for sure is Nebo, which I circled there. Uh, the other ones, approximate. Uh, approximate, good guesses uh, in, in this area. But what, what you're looking for is mountaintops where you can look down at the plains of Moab. So Nebo, which we know, here's a picture from Nebo looking down on the plains of Moab. So the dark area uh, there, um, it's, it, it's uh, the plains of Moab. That's kind of where God's people are camped out there. You probably can't see the Jordan River. Okay, you've got the Dead Sea over there. It's a hazy day. We're going to call this a hazy day. 
not light pollution in, in Scotland. That can't be the issue. So we've got the Dead Sea over there on the side. If you can see a little dark line up there, that's the um, Jordan River. But the plains of Moab are in the foreground. So as we're looking at this story and thinking about this story, it's Balaam and Balak are, have this kind of overview of the, you know what? If you look at the TV on the back wall, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit dark. It's a bit better, right? You're like, oh, that, oh, that's spectacular. Okay, back up here. All right. <laughs> so uh, that, that's kind of the view connected to the story as they're, they're looking over to bless, to bless God's people. Balak wants them to curse. Well, we're talking about this topic today of blessing and cursing. So I suppose that a good heart check for us all is to ask some pretty simple questions before we even dive into this. Question one. Do you really think that a curse is a threat to you? Do, do you think that a curse is a threat to you? Do, do, do you think that a curse can impact your life? That it can, it can take whatever normal was and veer it towards the awful? Do, do you think that if someone curses you, something takes place in the spiritual realm which messes up your life. It's curses. Blessings, which are the opposite. They're, they're kind of spiritual opposites of each other. But like, I guess the same question about blessings. Do you believe that blessings have a real impact in your life? That, that someone can speak a blessing over your life and something shifts in the invisible so that your life goes better than it normally would have? That, that things shift towards the good. That things greatly improve. Like actually improve. Because of a spoken blessing in your life. Before we dive in today, that's, that's at the heart of, of this whole chat. You're, if you're like, no, that these, are, these are nothing. This is just ancient, uneducated, superstition mumbo jumbo. Then you're, you're, you're going you're gonna to discount something that the Bible repeatedly talks about as very significant, very powerful, and worth doing. Obviously, um, the king of Moab believes in this, Balak. Balak, I mean, he is, he's willing to give whatever money it takes to have Balaam come down and curse God's people. And his view is that if this nation is cursed, even though they're bigger, stronger, no, that's all we know. They're bigger and stronger. Uh, that a curse could be the difference between his little nation being able to uh, drive them away or not. That, that a curse could shift the balance here so that the mightier nation is destroyed by the one that shouldn't win, normally speaking. But the curse makes the difference. So you've got Balak, and, and clearly God is very dialed into this whole idea of blessing and cursing. He is forbid. It, last week, he is just very intense. You must not curse these people that I've blessed. Why? Why would he be so intense about it? I mean, he's God. He can just be like veto, override, you know. Uh, why would God just be so intense, like shockingly intense, that, that Balaam not curse his people, and instead not only just not curse, but actually speak blessings over his people instead. Like, God thinks that there's something to this, uh, this blessing and cursing thing, that it can have such an impact that, that, that things shift. When we talked about blessings uh, a few years ago, I, we were talking about the story of Hannah. In 1 Samuel chapter 1. And, and in that story, that poor woman, and as we looked at it, she probably was 10, 15, maybe 17 years of not being able to have a baby. And we, we saw her anguish, her agony, as she was just suffering. And, and she would go before the tabernacle of, of God once a year, and she would not eat, and she would plead with God for, for a baby. And then year after year, it didn't happen, maybe even for 17 years or so. But then one day, she was there, and she was praying and pleading. She wasn't eating, and Eli the priest saw her. And Eli the priest, when he finally kind of figured out that she's just in anguish asking God for a desperate prayer request, 
He says a one-sentence blessing over her, and it shifts her life. This is all he said in his one-sentence blessing. He, it said, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, Eli responded, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant the request you've made from him, that you've made of him. He didn't even have to know what the prayer request was. He just, he just blesses that the God of Israel would grant her requests. And after years and years of anguish, that next year, she has a baby. The breakthrough happens after, it, it wasn't that she wasn't praying. It wasn't that she wasn't praying in anguish and tears. The blessing ends up bringing the breakthrough in her life after all those years. Now those blessings can, can be powerful in specific situations, but also in just general life scenarios. Just, there can be lives that are just blessed with God's favor and help. I'm thinking of Isaac. Isaac in Genesis chapter 26. Isaac uh, is told by God not to go to Egypt. And if he obeys, bless you. See what I did there? Yeah? <laughs> I'm tracking. Thanks for setting that up. We are, wow. Mm. If he obeys, then God will bless him. If he obeys, then God will bless him. And, and they talk about this. So he obeys, and even though there's a famine in the land, he doesn't go to this safer, easier place, Egypt, where there's water and, and food. He stays in the land, and he plants and in that year, in Genesis 26, while everybody else is dealing with this famine, he reaps a hundredfold harvest, a hundred times what he sold, which is great in a, in an, in a great year, that's great. It, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary harvest. And I want to remind you that he, he, the people around him grow jealous of his success because that's not just what was happening in all the fields. The neighbor fields aren't reaping a hundredfold harvest. It's just his field. And so he's getting crazy great rich because of God's favor and blessing are on his life different than the people around him. And, and that's, that's the thing about blessing. Blessing isn't just like, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. Blessing is God has, some, has something very intentional on Isaac's life here. That there's something spiritually on his life that in the normal realm, in the physical realm, things are far better than they normally would have been and that they are for, for everyone else. I'll, I'll just read it just because it's, it's so praiseworthy. It said in Genesis 26, Isaac sowed seed in the land and in that year he reaped a hundred times what was sown. The Lord blessed him. The man became rich and kept getting richer until he was very wealthy. Okay, so we see this idea of blessing in, in the Bible, and we see, we see the, the incredible impact that God blesses people, that people bless people, that priests, that priests bless people. In fact, God wants his priests to bless people, and he instructs his priests how to bless. He's like, this is, this is what, you know, the priest didn't have to ask Jesus or ask ask. God, what, what, what to bless people? God told them, I want my people blessed, and I want them blessed like this, Numbers chapter 6. I mean, it's also, it's also been made into a song in case you forget. Ah, ah. I listen to it all the time when I run, just to, to um, the three times I run. Anyways, uh, this is the blessing that, that God wants his priests to be proclaiming over his people. This is how... You were to bless the Israelites. You should say to them, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. God has set up his priesthood to speak blessings over the people of God. That's true in the Old Testament. It's also true in the New Testament. And what we find in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, is that you are a royal priesthood if you've given your life to Jesus. That you, that you have a priestly role in our nation, in our generation, in our planet if you've given your life to Jesus. You are a priest of God Most High under the high priesthood of Jesus. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. And so we then get the joy of being commissioned as people to 
bless people in an effective way. And by effective way, I mean in a way that sees things change in, in their life. I mean, I obviously believe in blessing. Like, I, if you've been to this church uh, recently in the last couple of years, I, I, I start by blessing every time I preach. I want God's goodness. I want God's breakthrough in, in your life. I believe that a blessing comes from a heart that really desires good things for the people in front of them, for whoever it is. A, a blessing is born of having God's heart. I want, I want your life to be better than it is now. I want things to improve. I want things to get unstuck. And so as a priest, all of us, what we want to do is we want to put on the compassion of Jesus that pushes us past the awkwardness of speaking a blessing. It's really that simple. Caring more about God's heart for someone than, than how we might be perceived in a moment. And, and speaking a blessing because we care about what happens in their life. We want, we want their studies to go better than they would have otherwise. We want their brain to be clear and, 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 and have good thoughts. We want their, their work to be successful. We want their life to be successful. We want their love and their, and their situations and relationships to be better. Uh, we, we want things to go great for them, and so we, we speak blessings. And blessings aren't complicated. To speak a blessing, it can be as simple as May God bless your relationship in Jesus' name. Or may God bless your work situation in the name of Jesus. May God bless your job interview. May God bless you as you study this year. May God bless you in, in Jesus' name. Like one sentence blessings can change. You want some New Testament examples? Look at all the ends of the books. You see these doxologies, you know, may the Lord bless you and keep you, or actually that's numbers. But like, you see all, you see all these like, may the, if you see the word may the, you're, you're starting to see things that are like blessings. I want, may, may this happen in your life. May this good thing happen in your life. They're all over the, the New Testament books. I believe in blessings. God believes in blessings. Blessings are real. Curses, which are the spiritual opposite. Just the same. They're real. I haven't gotten to Balaam yet. I should do that. So we're going to look at Balaam and Balak. They're on the hell. And we're not going to read most of the, these two chapters. But we're going to get a flavor for what's going on. Because Balak wants these people cursed. But God wants these people blessed. And so here's what happens in Numbers 23. It says this. Then Balaam said to Balak, build me seven altars here and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me. So Balak did as Balaam directed and they offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Balaam said to Balak, stay here by your burnt offering while I'm gone. Maybe the Lord will meet with me. I will tell you whatever he reveals to me. So he went to a barren hill. God met with him, and Balaam said to him, I have arranged seven altars and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Then the Lord put a message in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak and say what I tell you. So he returned to Balak, who was standing there by his burnt offering with all the officials of Moab. Okay, I'm not going to read the, the blessings specifically because they're, they're very specific to, to that area. Basically, the first blessing is God's blessed his people. You know, like these people are blessed. Uh, that's kind of the summary of it. But, but God speaks to, to Balaam, and then Balaam speaks out the blessing, and Balak is mad. That's the short of the, this, this cycle. God, and Balak's mad. And so Balak takes him to another location, another hilltop, and he builds seven more altars and offers another seven rams and seven bulls, seven, seven, uh, seven, seven bulls, yes, bulls and rams, uh, one, on each, one on each altar. And then Balaam steps aside to listen to God. Kind of a side note here, but, but just because I want good for you. Um, I just want to say this delicately. There's a lot of examples in the Bible of hearing from God or trying to hear from God. And I, I, I know that there are some people in this room that are really wanting to hear from God about some stuff in their lives. 
They're, 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 maybe you're seeking breakthrough in a search, certain situation or you've got some questions and you're like, God, I don't know what to do here. Maybe you're seeking guidance or help. And, and maybe you've been working on this for a while and your normal methods of seeking God aren't working. I don't know. I, that's not really the best way to say it. But, but you're not hearing yet. Now, we have our normal methods that we feel more comfortable with, but the, the Bible has a lot more examples uh, of people seeking God to hear and, and a lot of different things. Sometimes when I'm stuck, I will look at examples of other people seeking God and seeing what's working for them and maybe trying that. Again, I'm not saying that there's a formula here, but I'm noticing what Balaam's doing while he's wanting to hear from God. And what does he do? Very, very, very generous offering sacrifice. Seven bulls, seven rams, that's a big one. You can compare that to, to the, the normal sacrifices in the other Old Testament books. This is a very, very big offering sacrifice moment. It's a very big worship moment. It's a big, intense worship moment. Sometimes, maybe, maybe this is helpful for you, maybe, maybe not. Again, this is, there's no promises here, just ideas. If you're stuck, Balaam is doing a big offering sacrifice, and he's doing big over-the-top worship here for, for, for going to see God. And then he steps away from everybody. He goes off by himself, no distractions, um, Bringing your phone is probably bringing the world with you. You know, he's like going off by himself. Uh, he's not B-reeling his time over there. You know, like he, he's by himself seeking God uh, alone until he hears. Now, again, if, you know, I'm not saying anything, but if you're stuck, maybe that's some, some ideas as we look at Balaam. Anyways, so Balaam hears from God again. He pronounces a second blessing, basically the exact opposite of what Balak wants. Basically that God's people are going to be successful in battle. Okay, that's, that's the exact opposite. Balak is raging again. And so then they go to a third mountain peak. And I'm going to name this peak because it's important for next week. Peor. Peor. And they're going to go on to the top of Peor where he's going to do a third blessing. The reason why I'm going to mention this is because Baal of Peor is going to be a part of the, the wrecking of God's people in the next chapter. And so Balaam, I, I picture Balaam going to this mountain and getting an evil idea. Anyways, that's, that's for next week. But he's, he's up on Peor, and this is what we read. Since Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel... He did not go seek omens as on previous occasions, but he turned towards the wilderness. When Balaam looked up and saw Israel encamped tribe by tribe, the Spirit of God came on him. Okay, so no offerings this time. No, uh, no going off alone to hear God. This time he just knows that it's on God's heart to bless. When we bless someone, we don't need to have some sort of prophetic word. We can just want good things for them. We don't have to have something specific. If we want to we bless someone, okay, what would God ideally want done in this person's life right now? If, if, if perfect happened, if the best thing happened, okay, well then I bless in the name of Jesus that your life turns around for the better. That, that things uh, are unstuck in the name of Jesus. Having that compassion. It's, we don't have to overthink the blessings that we, we speak. You can just bless people that things get better. In the first couple blessings, Balaam did have to hear from God first. But that's because, man, God was so specifically clear that what Balaam was doing was dangerous. Why was it dangerous? Because blessings and cursings are powerful and, 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 and have impact. And so because it's powerful, like, he had to hear specifically from God. But now Balaam gets it. He knows that it's God's heart to bless, and so he just blesses. So he blesses a third time, and again, it's a positive thing. And Balak is furious, Numbers 24, verse 10. It says, then Balak became furious with Balaam, struck his hands together. I kind of imagine it like this. No. No, not striking his hands in clapping, yay, no. Struck his hands together 
and said to him, I summoned you to put a curse on my enemies, but instead you have blessed them these three times. Now go to your home. I said I would reward you richly, but look, the Lord has denied you a reward. This is on Peor, and he's, he's getting no money. Balaam answered Balak, didn't I previously tell the messengers you sent me, if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, which would be his heart's secret desire, I could not go against the Lord's command to do anything good or bad of my own will. I will say whatever the Lord says. Now I'm going back to my people. But first, let me warn you what these people will do to your people in the future. With these words, something has shifted. Let me warn you what these people will do to your people in the future. I want to I want to just highlight that we are now shifting from blessing to prophecy and they're different. He he is he's no longer speaking a blessing, he is prophesying. He's he's hearing from God and he's speaking about what will happen in the future. Sometimes the question gets asked, is a blessing a prophecy or is a blessing path setting? And mostly, 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 prophecy is prophecy. A blessing or a curse, the opposite way, a blessing is path setting. And I find this incredibly wonderful and, and, and amazing as God's people. Like, when, when, you're, when you're dealing with path setting, when you're, when you're speaking of a blessing over someone, you might be redirecting their path. And things might actually be shifting from stuck to unstuck. It's, it's not that you're prophesying things will get unstuck, but you are path setting by speaking a blessing in, in the name of, of Jesus. I think this is so significant to me. It's so wonderful. As a priest of God, under the priesthood of Jesus, you have the authority to speak positive words over people's lives that will bring positive fruit and positive results that they wouldn't have experienced otherwise had you not proclaimed that blessing over them. I'll say it for all of us. Wow. Wow. I bet, though, some of you struggle believing that's, that's true uh, for you, that, that you could have that kind of life-shifting impact, that a one-sentence blessing could redirect somebody's life from thwarted to thriving, maybe from sickly to healthy, maybe from stuck to successful or broken to breakthrough. Like, do you really have that kind of, that authority in the name of Jesus to speak that kind of life-changing breakthrough? You do. You do. Now, the Balaam story isn't over yet, and, and we'll pick up one more time next week. But before I, I, I want to say, before I stop, I want to say something about curses. I want to say curses, and, and I guess blessings. But curses, they're real. They're They're demonic. They're evil, and they can really mess you up. We have Jesus, and so we can break curses in the name of Jesus. We're not stuck under curses, but we've got to break them in, in the name of Jesus. And some of you are suffering under curses. You don't have to know about it to be suffering under a curse. You don't have to know about a blessing to be enjoying the benefit of a blessing. For instance, if you have an ancestor... A grandfather, a great-grandfather, a great-great-grand... You get it. Somebody, an ancestor, who was a Freemason. They curse, they speak curses over their descendants, especially those who follow Jesus. And, and that's, that the curse is, is going to be on your life, and you need to break those curses in the name of Jesus. The longer that they were a Freemason, the more curses that they have spoken over your life. Now, that's just an easy one, a basic one, a well-known one, but, but if you have that in your background, there's some curses to be broken in the name of Jesus, specifically uh, in, in the area of, of, well, man, there's, depending on how long they were a mason, a lot of things to break in the name of Jesus. As a church, we deal with, from time to time, witchcraft curses against our church. We see evidences around different buildings of, of witchcraft things from time to time. 
We've got to break those off in the name of Jesus. Not all of our neighbors speak positively about us, and they might speak words of desiring demise, um, and we, we flip that around, and we, we need to break those off in, in the name of Jesus. Now, I don't say this like curse stuff to, to, to scare you, but I say it to make you wise so that you can break them in the name of Jesus and see breakthrough in your life. That's what I want. I, I want any curses that might be blocking your success to be broken or your happiness to be broken or your relationships uh, against your relationships to be broken or stealing your peace and joy to be broken. I want those things to be broken so that you can, you can walk in the joy and peace of a, this, a blessed life with the favor of God and Jesus. How do you break a curse? Well, the first thing I would be doing today is I would just be like, I break any and every curse that is over my life in the name of Jesus. It's got to be in the name of Jesus. I break, in the name of Jesus, I break a curse in the name of Jesus. Any and every curse. If there's a curse over my finances in the name of Jesus, I break that curse in the name of Jesus. Just drop the name of Jesus. If you're super spiritual, you can drop the blood of Jesus. You can, you can drop the cross of Jesus. Uh, but, but, you know, in the name of Jesus, I break a curse. And, and again, if you feel like there's something against your success or there's potentially something against your success, you can be like, I break off this curse against my mind or my success or my finances or my relationships in the name of Jesus. You're just breaking them up. What if you try and break off a curse that's not there? Nothing happens. It's okay. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I'd rather be over the top. That's, that's my life. I'd rather be over the top. <laughs> Then, then, um, then live under a curse, you know, just in case. Now, again, maybe you think this is weird, <laughs> but what if it's true anyways? I think that's the thing. What if it's true anyways? What if the path of your life can be shifted significantly by breaking off curses and by being blessed in the name of Jesus? If, if you wonder about this, go for prayer and, and let them work with you on breaking curses and letting them bless you in the name of Jesus. A few years ago, uh, Kelly and I, we went to uh, this thing that was dealing with breaking off Freemason curses. Both of our ancestries have uh, Freemasonry in their background. And we went through and just breaking off all the curses connected to Freemasonry over our lives. I've experienced that process and breaking off, was it weird? Yes. Was it great? Yes. We just got breaking that off in the name of Jesus. I experienced the power of breaking curses in my life. I've also experienced the power of blessing. A few years ago, we were talking about blessing. And we have been working so hard, so hard at trying to find a location for this church. Right? We were working so hard on it. We were uh, searching every six years. We were praying for a new location. And then finally, the south side uh, was becoming a potential location, but, and, but months were going by, and it just wasn't coming all the way together. And I was teaching on Hannah a few years ago, and at the end of that message, um, I, I had everybody stand up as we talked about blessing, and I had them bless me in the name of Jesus. Yep, I'm, I'm vain that way. I'm, I'm, I'm greedy that way. And, and so the whole church stood up, and they blessed me in the name of Jesus, and then, you know, I had them do it again, because... Why get, you know, why not have double blessing? So I had them do it again. Morning service, evening service. Just blessing in the name of Jesus, right? The next day, we got the call that things were, that things were coming together. Now, after years of praying for more space, we had this time of, of blessing and the next day, things. after months of trying to get the South Side to come together, the next day, we got the call that things were now going to be coming together. It, 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 it seems like, I mean, you're like, Brian, your faith must have been so low to be surprised by that. Of course blessings can shift things and shift things immediately in your life. Well, I believe that. And joyfully, I believe that for you, whether you believe it for you or not. Uh, so that's why when you come to this church, I am going to be blessing you because I want extraordinary things to be happening in your life way better than normal uh, by pronouncing blessings over you. Oh, anyways, we got we to gotta do some challenges here. Challenge number one through five. <laughs> Basically, um, if you, if you find out if you have any Freemasonry ancestors. And, and how high level they might have been. If you do research how to break family Freemasonry curses over your life, 
You can Google it. We'd love to help you here. Uh, we want to help you break free from any potential curses. Uh, access, uh, assess areas of frustration in your life and, and just break off curses there. Maybe they're there. Maybe they're not. Break off those curses in the name of Jesus. Then bless yourself in the name of Jesus. And you, you need to do this out loud. Blesses and, blessings and curses, you've got to do this out loud. Bless yourself in the name of Jesus. And as a priest of God, start blessing people with brief blessings in the name of Jesus. Now, you might think that that's weird, but it's so much more wonderful than weird. Give it a go. Give, give it a go. You'll get, you'll get used to it. All right, I need to pray. L let, me, let me pray. And uh, God, thank you for writing about this stuff in your word. Thank you for preserving it through the ages. The, we, I would be personally very blind to the realities and the joys and the power of blessings and, and the frustrations connected to cursings, if you hadn't written this down in, in your, your Bible, uh, hundreds of times describing it and what's going on there. Uh, in, in, with my upbringing, God, and with my background, I would have given it no thought. But I praise you that you recorded the realities, the spiritual realities that, that can be at work to shift things towards the better in our lives. Thank you. What, what a... What a glorious God you are. And thank you, and we praise you for entrusting us with the ability to powerfully bless other people. God, bless this church. I, I, we bless this church in the name of Jesus that it would grow and flourish and, and, and prevail in whatever challenges we're facing right now. That we would bear much fruit, fruit that will last. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.